what we're going to do now is just remind ourselves of the ethics knowledge that we're meant to have. We did the questions first, just to remind you, because the ethics knowledge for this paper is in fact the same knowledge that you're meant to have already from having done paper F8. So this next section should just be revision, and as a result we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on it, as it should be fairly straightforward. So, let's have a little reminder then of ethics and what knowledge we're expected to have. The starting point is to remember that with ethics there are some fundamental principles, some overriding important areas which we're expected to follow. Those are integrity, professional behaviour, due care and competence, confidentiality and objectivity. So let's just note those down. Now, we shouldn't really need a reminder of what all of these mean, and realistically, at this sort of level, it's unlikely you'd be asked to explain these terms. That's more for paper F8. But there are two words in that list that are actually probably a bit more important than the others, and that's objectivity and confidentiality, both of which have appeared in questions on P7. So let's have a quick reminder of what we're meant to know about confidentiality. Now, of course, it's a relatively straightforward concept that if you're going to advise clients on their financial matters, or if you're going to be auditing their financial statements, you're bound to pick up knowledge which is very private within the organisation. As you might expect, the underlying rule is that you should not be disclosing this information to anybody else. That's common sense, I think. However, there may be situations where you are either forced to disclose this information to others or you may choose to disclose this information to others. Since you could find yourself being prosecuted if you were to do this in situations where you shouldn't be disclosing, it's important that we understand when these situations might arise. So firstly, let's consider the sort of situations where you might be forced to disclose. The first example is one that we have in fact already seen on the course. If you believe that money laundering might be going on at your client, you are almost certainly, since most countries have gone by this rule, you will almost certainly have to disclose this fact to the regulatory authorities who will then do their own investigation. And don't forget, you'll have to disclose this without your client knowing it's being disclosed. There may be other situations where your client will allow you to disclose information that is usually private, but in this particular case, you don't mention it to the client. If you're suspicious, report it. The next two on the list... I hope you will never ever see, and realistically it's fairly unlikely. But as you might imagine in today's climate, if you do see something that you suspect is linked to terrorism, you will almost certainly have to disclose that to the relevant authorities. <laughs> 
treason, where you believe that somehow your client is involved in some attempt to overthrow a government, is again fairly unlikely to cross your desk when you're an auditor. But I suppose it could happen. And again, with treason, the chances are that you're expected to disclose it. From time to time, the ACCA will need to check the quality of your work. If they turn up and ask to look at particular files, claiming client confidentiality and refusing to let them is probably not going to work. With the ACCA, I'm afraid you'll have to let them have a look. Now, those are some examples where you will almost certainly be forced to disclose, and there aren't that many of them. There may also be situations where you choose to disclose. Let's have a look at those. Of course, this information belongs to your client. If your client says they have no problem with you disclosing it, then presumably there is no problem with you disclosing it. But I suspect you might want to get that permission in writing, just to prove it was given. There may also be some situations where there is no law forcing you to disclose, but the information that you have is of the nature that you think maybe it's in the public interest for you to disclose it. Acting in the public interest, or at least not acting against the public interest, is very important for accountants. It's part of what we might call professional behaviour. So let's imagine, for example, that you are the auditor of a company with a factory. And one lunchtime, whilst at this factory, you're taking a little walk, eating your sandwiches, and you notice that one of the staff members of the factory, has come out of the back of the factory with a big hosepipe, has taken it down to the local river, and seems to be dumping something in that river. You notice that the water is turning a funny colour. There's a rather odd smell and there's smoke. In fact, I think, if you look carefully, some of the fish are floating to the surface. That's probably not good, is it? I'm not sure what they're putting in that river, but I don't think I like it you suspect that that local river might feed into the local water supply. Naturally, you're concerned that this could cause problems for the local population. You've checked things out, and there don't appear to be any rules forcing you to tell anybody about this, but you can't help feeling that you really ought to. That's the sort of situation where you might well choose to disclose because you feel it's in society's interests. However, if there is no law to back up your disclosure, the best advice is to go and get legal advice before you do anything. So if you get a question on the exam and it seems to be suggesting that some sort of disclosure, some breach of confidentiality might need to happen, if you're not sure of the answer, the best thing to always write is to seek legal advice because lawyers should know the answer. Well, that's about it for confidentiality. It's an F8 level subject, so it doesn't come up that often on P7, but it's worth a quick reminder just to make sure. We're going to move on now and look at the most important bit of ethics for paper P7. The good news is that the most important bit is actually also the most important bit on F8. So again, you should already know this stuff, and that is objectivity.
Objectivity is about having a clear mind when carrying out tasks. Nothing else should be in there influencing what you're doing. So, for example, when considering an accounting transaction and trying to decide where the debits and credits should go, the only things you should be thinking about are the facts of the situation and the relevant accounting standards and maybe legal rules. You shouldn't be thinking about what's the easiest thing to do, what would improve the profit the most, what will improve your bonus the most, or what will keep your boss happy. All of those should be irrelevant. The problem, of course, is there are plenty of situations where either you might choose to start considering any of those things, or people might think that you're considering those things. So even if you're completely honest and doing things properly, if a situation arises where people might think that you're not being objective, that is pretty much as bad as not being objective yourself. So the key to this is you must be objective and be seen, believed to be objective. So why might you put the wrong debits and credits in a set of accounts? As an auditor, why might you ignore what's really going on? Well, of course, there are lots of reasons why you might choose to do it and lots of reasons why people might think that you've chosen to do it. The key to this, the key to being objective and being seen to be objective, is independence. If we can try to make sure that you and your client are kept far apart and that the outside world believes that you and your client are far apart, then we should be okay. So the key to objectivity is independence. So I suppose the next place to go with this is to say, why might I not be independent and therefore not be, or be seen to be, objective? What can threaten my independence? Well, hopefully from F8, you remember some of the terms which I'm about to put up on the screen. So, these would appear to be the main types of threat. Uh, let's just consider some examples to make sure we remember these. Self-interest. This is the threat caused by the auditor, accountant or whoever deciding that for their own interests it's best to do something other than what is right. So, for example, let's imagine you're auditing a company's financial statements and you've discovered what you believe to be a major mistake. However, you know that the client won't be happy that you've found this mistake and this is a very important one of your clients. They pay you a lot of fees and you don't want to upset them. There is, of course, now a danger that you decide not to mention the mistake because you don't want to upset the client. So that's an example of the self-interest threat. The second threat on the list, intimidation, is a bit like self-interest, only the other way around. If a client is paying you a lot of fees and they know that they are one of your important clients, even if you are not willing to lie and cheat on their behalf, the danger, of course, is that they will try to force you to do this, knowing that they can put financial pressure on you. So self-interest and intimidation often appear together in questions. <laughs> 
The third one on the list is self-review. Imagine if the ACCA allowed you to mark your own exam paper. Well, hopefully it's fairly obvious why they don't. Not only might you cheat and give yourself a few more marks, but even if you were completely honest and didn't, every time you passed an exam, the outside world would look at this and assume that you've cheated. And your protests would go unheard. So you marking your own exams, frankly, is fairly pointless. No one would believe it. In the financial world, auditors are there to check that the financial statements are true and fair. In doing this, auditors assess the debits and credits that have been put in, and of course we also assess the internal control systems that the client is using. Therefore, if the auditors are involved in putting the debits and credits into the accounts, we actually do the bookkeeping for the client, or if the auditors are involved in too much advice on improving internal control systems, the danger is that when we're carrying out the audit, we're actually checking our own work. Again, hopefully we would check it carefully, but bear in mind the last person who will find a mistake is normally the person who made it in the first place. And secondly, even if you do check things properly, if the outside world knows that you're checking your own work, they're bound to be suspicious that you're not doing it properly. So that's self-review. Familiarity is probably the most obvious of the threats. Can I audit my brother's company, for example? Well, I could, and I may well do a very accurate job, but the outside world would be suspicious. So it's probably best that I don't. It's not just family members, though. Auditing companies that I used to work for, where maybe I've got lots of friends working, would also be dangerous. And of course, if I audit the same company year after year after year, there's a danger that that gap between the auditors and the directors is going to close. Because if you keep seeing the same people, you're bound to start getting familiar with them. Advocacy is the threat which is probably the hardest for most students to understand and therefore explain in the exam. An advocate is a representative. In fact, in many countries, lawyers, your legal representatives, are often referred to as advocates. So what's this all about then? Well, let's imagine that your client has got tax problems. They've been called in for an investigation and because you are their auditor, their accountant, they've asked you to go along to the investigation too and help them out. The problem is that the client presumably wants you to argue why they should be paying less tax. Any arguments you may be aware of that would result in them paying more tax are not what your client wants to hear. They are paying you to represent one side of the argument only. You are advocating, holding their view. Well, if you can't look at something from both directions, you're not being objective. And the danger is that if you're the auditor of this company and the outside world knows that you're also advising the client in certain matters and taking their position, they may assume that when you audit the financial statements, you will also take the client's position and ignore mistakes you might find. If you become an advocate in any way for your client, the danger is that people see you and the client as too close together. So we should avoid situations like that. The final one on the list is a fairly general type of threat. The management threat. Remember, we're trying to keep you and the management of the company separate so that people believe that you are checking the accounts in a completely independent and open way. If you take on any management roles for the company, for example, let's say they're looking for a new finance director and they ask you to find someone for them, well, if you're actually taking a decision like that, a decision which the director should be taking, the danger is to the outside world, you have basically become a director. You and the management have become the same thing. Of course, there are other problems here as well. Imagine you did find a new finance director for a client, 
What if that finance director now makes lots of mistakes in the financial statements? Do you want to tell the rest of the board that the person you recommended isn't very good at their job? Or might you be tempted to ignore their mistakes to avoid looking stupid? So that's the management threat. It's very important in this exam that you're able to identify the types of threat in given situations. And we've seen that already in the questions that we've done. Also, it's important that you know what audit firms can do to try to solve these threats, or at least reduce them to an acceptable level. And reducing threats to objectivity are known as safeguards. So let's just remind ourselves of a few of those. Now, there are, of course, several safeguards, and it will depend on the situation that has arisen. But here are some of the more common ones. Whenever you think there is any type of ethical threat, or in fact any type of threat of any sort, which could result in the audit being done wrongly, it would be a good idea, before the audit is signed off and the audit report signed, for a second partner, who has not been involved in the audit at all, to review the work done and make sure there is no evidence of the audit being done badly. Because this check is done before the audit report is signed off, it is called a hot review. The files are still open, they're still warm because they're still being worked on, hence a hot review. When we look at the practice management part of the course and look at quality control, we'll introduce the concept of cold reviews as well. Hot reviews are done on a fairly frequent basis. For example, when I was an auditor a few years ago, my firm had a rule that said a hot review would be done for every audit where there was an ethical issue, every new client that we'd not audited before, any client where the audit report was going to be modified or qualified, and situations like that. Common sense. Rotating staff on the audit teams is important to ensure that there's not too much familiarity being built up. Every few years, the partner who signs the audit report should be changed over to keep the view fresh, to keep objectivity. And it would be wise if other senior staff are switched around every few years as well. At the lower level, it's less important to change the staff over. And don't forget that at lower levels... Audit staff are moving from being trainees to being qualified, and therefore there is a natural rotation of staff anyway. And finally, on this little selection of safeguards, other services. There are all sorts of potential threats if, as well as being the auditor, we're doing other things for our client as well. Self-review threats, for example, if we are doing their accounts as well as auditing them. We may also have self-interest threats. If we're doing lots of other services, we might not be keen to upset the client by highlighting errors in their accounts because of all the lovely fees we're earning from them. And of course, there's a familiarity threat. If you're carrying out lots of other services for a client, your staff are bound to be at the client's premises on a regular basis. And the more often you're there, the more likely you are to become familiar. Corporate governance, Sarbane-Oxley in the United States, for example, has 
led to a reduction in the quantity of other services that audit firms are providing for their clients. Some have become illegal and some are just not worth the hassle because of the increased regulation that's been created. But in most countries it is still possible for auditors to carry out additional services of some sort. So it's important that you consider the ethical threats and deal with them. For example, by using different teams of staff and reviewing the total fees that you're earning from that client. Finally, in this review of our ethics knowledge from paper F8, let's remind ourselves about conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest on the exam are typically situations where you have two or maybe more clients and you've got yourself into a situation where advising one of them might be a problem for the other. So we've got a situation where the best advice for one client would actually be bad news for the other client and lead to them suffering in some respect. The problem that you have is you must give the best advice to your clients, but equally you don't want to hurt other clients. And you may find that you've got yourself in a situation that's virtually impossible to deal with. So the key to conflicts of interest is to try to avoid getting into the situation in the first place. Although, of course, that's easier said than done. If you do get a conflict of interest, and you've got yourself into a situation where there are two clients and you can't advise one without hurting the other, what are you going to do about it? Well, there's a fairly standard list of possible solutions. If you spot this problem early enough, you may be able to solve it by ensuring you have two separate teams headed up by two separate partners and maybe from two separate offices if your audit firm has two separate offices, of course. By doing that, you should ensure that no single member of staff is involved in both clients and therefore the risk of transfer of information should be avoided. Of course, the client might not be happy with this solution and when they realise that you're advising another firm with whom they're linked, they may well decide they don't want your advice anymore. And you must tell both clients that a conflict has arisen, what you're doing about it, the safeguards you've put in place, but allow them to make the decision. Don't hide this from them. Increased confidentiality would be a wise move. Both clients will be nervous that information about them could get over to the other company. So locking the files away, if they're computer files, additional password security, and reminding the staff involved that this situation is particularly sensitive and they must be more careful. 
It may be, however, that you feel that the two companies are so closely linked that the best tactic is to resign from one of them, or maybe both. If you discover a conflict too late, you may well have members of staff who know things about both companies. Simply resigning from one is not a solution, because those members of staff, when advising the other company, know about the one you've resigned from, and you owe confidentiality to that other company, even though you've now resigned. It may be that too many of your staff simply already know too much information to allow you to work for either client anymore. So that's conflicts of interest and the end of this revision of the ethics knowledge that you need for paper P7. Don't forget, it's the same stuff that you picked up from paper F8. So when you're looking at ethics and working on it for this exam, don't spend a long period of time reading the notes. You should know that stuff already. It's all about question practice.